conflicting versions of the nuclear deal with Iran. The Iranian foreign minister says sanctions will be lifted immediately if a final deal is agreed upon, while the U.S. claims it will be gradual. Kenya begins three days of mourning for the 148 victims of the terror attack on students by militant group Al-Shabaab, while threats of additional attacks on the country circulate. And Yemen's Houthi militiamen, supported by army units, gain ground in the southern city of Aden, pushing back loyalists of Saudi-backed president. The News Today with Lucy Aharish. Good evening and welcome to the news today. The framework nuclear deal announced with Iran this past Thursday seemed to represent the finish line. But after this historic step, it's only the beginning of a road to a final deal in June. Once the parties left Lausanne, Switzerland, the message sent back home have been a little bit different. As to be expected, both Iran and the U.S. presented it as a win for them. There are stark differences in how they are portrayed trying the guidelines from sanctions relief to inspections to uranium enrichment. Also today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made the rounds on the U.S. morning political shows, slamming the deal and saying it keeps infrastructure, centrifuges and nuclear facilities in place. Before that, let's take a look back. به اون وعده عمل خواهیم کرد البته مشروط بر اون که طرف مقابل هم به وعده های خود عمل کند Many key details will need to be finalized over the next three months and nothing is agreed to until everything is agreed and if there's backsliding there will be no deal اجرای تعهدات خودشون در صورت نقض تعهدات توسط طرف مقابل امتناع بود This deal would pose a grave danger to the region and to the world and would threaten the very survival of the state of Israel Shaking hands. With me is a senior Iranian politics analyst, Mayor Javed Amfar. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. And also senior Middle East analyst, Alvi Sakhalov. Good evening. Good evening. And investigative journalist, Martin Himmel. Good evening. Thank Good you very you. much uh, for coming. Uh, before I will start talking with you, Mayor, about um, winning or not and what is the contradicting reports in Iran, is it a big win for the United States? Well, I think it's all very premature. I mean, we heard. Mr. Obama speak about this, and we've heard the uh, Iranian president speak about it, but what we haven't heard really speak about it is the man who runs Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei. And that's all that counts. What he thinks and what his executive council thinks is all that counts. So we see wonderful handshakes and lots of aspirations for uh, an agreement, but there is no agreement. Not yet, at least. Um, you know, before we finished our two-hour special on uh, Thursday, we said that maybe, maybe Rouhani and uh, uh, Javad Zarif needs to take a small vacation before they're going back to Iran. Ayatollah <laughs> Khamenei um, is satisfied with this deal? Difficult to know, but what, what we can say with far more certainty is that uh, Zarif and Rouhani would not, Zarif would not agree with anything unless it was agreed by Ayatollah Khamenei. In fact, today it was uh, confirmed that the Supreme National Security Council was with the, was communicating with the negotiation team in, in Lausanne every step of the way. That, of course, includes the representatives of the Supreme Leader. Um, so Ayatollah Khamenei, it's, it, can, it can be said that has agreed with everything that's happened now. Now, what has been is agreed? He, That's is, another question. Exactly. But is he agreeing with, uh, let's say, warm welcoming that uh, uh, Zarif and Wuhani got when they came back to Iran? Um, probably. I mean, uh, he, you know, uh, it's warm welcoming now. But wait till you know if there is a deal and when they start going after them, the conservatives. I thought how many tries to, 
you know, he subcontracts it, the good news and the bad news, you know. So he subcontracts the, 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 the work to, to his ministers. That's, in fact, why we have a president in Iran, one of the major... He does the work, subcontracts the, the... He does the work on behalf of the supreme leader. We have to wait and see. But I have to say that, uh, you know, the, the reaction we've been getting in Iran, in America, and especially in the state of Israel, it's as if a deal has been signed, it hasn't. If we're talking about uh, Israel, we're talking about, uh, Avi, the reaction of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, maybe Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is right. Maybe this is not such a good deal. Maybe the, let's say, intervention of Iran in the Middle East was not taking uh, taking uh, under consideration. So. Maybe Maybe he is right. Look, I think that that was the immediate instinct of Benjamin Netanyahu. Everything that regards the negotiations between the U.S. and Iran is immediately no, 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 no. Just like the, the, the children's story about this bear that is saying no, no, no all the time. At some point, you, you stop listening. You stop really listening carefully for what he has to say. Maybe it is such, not such a good deal. I'm sure that Israel would like to see a much better deal than the one that is offered right now on the table. But bottom line, what are the options? Is no deal better than the current deal? I doubt that. I'm sorry to say that because Can Israel bottom line, demand, like Benjamin Netanyahu is demanding, that Israel will be part of this deal? That it Israel can will push. It can push. It can demand. It, well, not really demand, but can ask the U.S. politely or non-politely, like we see right now Netanyahu doing. But at the end of the day, you know, because of the disconnection between the two leadership, because of the complete distrust between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, I think that Obama will continue with the negotiations the way that he sees it. Bottom line, I think that Netanyahu, what he's trying to do it now, right now, is to, uh, to prepare the coming uh, agreement, meaning to push the U.S. by, uh, by all kinds of means, and maybe, just maybe, to prepare the public opinion, the international public opinion, for some kind of a scenario in which Israel will need to take some military measures in order to stop Iran. So uh, let's say, uh, let's see how uh, Benjamin Netanyahu just uh, started preparing. Uh, um, Benjamin Netanyahu made the round on American uh, Sunday morning talk shows, reiterating his uh, stance on the Iranian nuclear deal. Here's what he had to say on NBC's Met the Press. I'm not trying to kill any deal. I'm trying to kill a bad deal. And you say it's a historic uh, decision, a historic deal. It could be a historically bad deal because uh, it leaves the preeminent terrorist state of our time with a vast nuclear infrastructure. Remember, not one centrifuge is destroyed. Thousands uh, of centrifuges will be left spinning uranium. Not a single facility, including underground facilities, nuclear facilities, is being shut down. Uh, this is a, a, a deal that leaves Iran with the capacity to produce the material for many, many nuclear bombs, and it does so by lifting the sanctions pretty much up front. You know, there's, uh, there's three things that Noah ta is talking about. First of all, he's not just a spokesman for Israel now. He's the spokesman of the world. He's, no, all, uh, even no, the Gulf he, countries, no, no, uh, he, the no, Saudi no, no. Arabia. No, he's, yes, he's a spokesman for him, for Saudi Arabia, for Egypt. I've heard the Saudi ambassador on the same show. He's much more eloquent. He's much more tactful. But he says the same thing. Uh, you know, in this rare sort of perfect storm, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt agree it's a bad deal. That's going to have major consequences. That means that even if the deal is signed, somebody else is going to be going nuclear. Well, Israel's nuclear already, but others are going to go nuclear. It's not going to just stop there. The other two points that I just wanted to make is, there's another tactic that no one talks about. There's a brilliant Iranian tactic here of playing for time. Do you think the Iranians are just keeping everything static while they play for more time and more time and more time? I mean, I've heard analysts say that the breakout time, if this agreement isn't signed, is two or three months. Well, that effectively means that Iran already has a bomb. What it means is that they got all the components. They got enriched uranium. They might have, they have uh, carrier capability. They just haven't put it together. And so the question then remains, you know, what kind of a Middle East are we there? Um, Maybe the world is giving Iran too much time. Um, I don't think they are. I don't think they are. Too, well, when we say two or three months away, I mean, in terms of the enriched uranium, they have turned all their 20% enriched uranium that they had to into oxide. 
because of the previous deal we signed in November 2013. So they don't have the enriched uranium right now to do that. And as far as we know, um, Iran has not decided to make a nuclear weapon, and they've made some research and development into making a weapon, but it's not anywhere to be clear. It's not anywhere to be decisive that they, they can make a weapon. I just want to bring something up. Prime Minister Netanyahu says that we should use this deal in order to stop Iran's support for terrorism in this region. I think we all agree that Iranian regime for, 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 for Hezbollah and for Syria is all bad, okay? Now, I would like Avi to jump in here and, and correct me. Can we reach a deal whereby inspectors are going to go to Lebanon to disarm Hezbollah <laughs> and no. then go back again to make sure that Hezbollah is not rearmed, because that's what Prime Minister Netanyahu wants. Can somebody plead? Because to me, that sounds like somebody who has a death wish. And as far, I mean, we couldn't disarm Hamas. We live next door to them. Now, I think that's unrealistic. In, in an ideal world, it should happen. I, but I, Avi, is it, am I being unrealistic that it's not going to happen? Avi, before, so. before you're answering, I want to see if it's realistic or not. Let's join to this uh, conversation. On the line is uh, retired Major General Amos uh, Yadlin, former head of IDF Military Intelligence. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. So, uh, Mr. Yadlin, is it... Uh, is some kind of a reality to ask to dismantle totally Iran? Uh, <clears throat> I don't think that this is a, a real option at that time. Uh, and the negotiation have started uh, in September 2013, uh, which uh, the interim agreement on uh, January 2014 uh, basically on the idea of uh, rollback for rollback. And how much rollback is exactly what the negotiation was about. Rollback the sanctions against rollback the, the nuclear program. So, uh, Mr. Yellen, do you think that the, the reaction maybe uh, of Benjamin Netanyahu was a little bit overreacted? I think uh, I don't uh, want to give uh, remarks to the prime minister. <coughs> And I understood his concern. But what really should be done at that moment is uh, a three-dimension uh, uh, policy. One, to make sure that the agreement is a better agreement. Uh, all the blurred articles about uh, R&D, about uh, the a potential military uh, dimension of Iran activity in the program about what will exactly happen to the centrifuges that are dismantled. Uh, all these articles should be much clearer. This is one approach, uh, one dimension. The second dimension is to make sure that inspection is, uh, is uh, all over the place in all the sites, in all the documents, in all the organizations that are connected to the nuclear program of, of Iran. And the last dimension is to make the assumption that uh, the North Korean scenario may happen and Iran may break the agreement uh, in the future and to reach uh, an Israeli-American uh, uh, understanding and maybe even an, a parallel agreement what should be done in case that Iran is breaking? Exactly, agreement? exactly in this point, and I want to ask you, as someone who has a lot of experience, do you think, and once upon a time we asked the same question to uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, do you think that Israel can actually, by itself, um, stop the Iranian uh, enrichment or stop the Iranian nuclear program or actually attack Iran and say, okay, I'm going and acting on this by myself? The, the possibility is there, but the real, uh, the real assessment for a prime minister of Israel is how much time, how many years delay he will achieve by attacking, comparing to the 10 years or 15 years of this agreement. If this agreement will be really implemented and the Iranians will be uh, complying with the agreement, we are gaining at least 10 years, uh, and the program is not expanding. So do you so, think that it's a good deal? 
So why thinking about attacking now? If you want to attack and you don't trust the Iranian and you see that they are cheating, you can do it in the future. But at least give a chance to the Iranians. First, give a chance to the agreement to be uh, uh, to be signed, because what we had uh, in Lausanne last week was not an agreement, was a declaration of principles. And then give a chance to the Iranians to comply with uh, the rollback of their program. Um, Amos Yadlin, uh, Major uh, uh, General Amos Yadlin, thank you very much uh, for this conversation with us. Avi, you wanted to answer. Well, I, I guess then again, what, what I hear from here and what I hear from other specialists about nuclear issues, you know, even the, the bad deal, and let's assume that it's a bad deal, takes us back to the point in which Iran is far from uh, a year from the famous red line of 25 Ks of 90 percent unreached uranium. So a year back, instead of two or three months that we were at the eve of the, the interim agreement of November 2013, uh, uh, January 2014. So it's not such a catastrophe. One of the key elements here and one of the big questions that we need to ask is this agreement include the taking out of Iran of the unreached uranium that they have right now, the 3.5 percent unreached uranium. I can answer that. There's two options. One of them is that it's either taken out to, uh, to Russia. The other is that it's turning to oxide. Now, uh, theoretically speaking, once it's turning to oxide, it can be reconverted back into uranium, but Iran apparently does not have the capability to do well, that. Let me ask you one other question. Why was this framework not initialed? Why was it not signed? What I see here is I haven't seen an Iranian agreement. I see Iranian intentions, but not an agreement. That's what's brilliant about the Iranian approach. I'm saying to myself, they didn't sign because there might be an element here of good cop, bad cop. You know, that's how you negotiate sometimes. A good cop is uh, the foreign minister. The bad cop is Khamenei. I think that there's a very long way till you know, June 30th. Then mm -hmm. we will see what's going to happen then. But other than that, I totally agree with you. This is a, not such a bad deal for Israel. This is a very bad deal for the Middle East and for the future of the Middle East. Because Iran, after the removing of the sanctions, will get more money in order to invest in Syria, in Iraq, in Gaza, in Lebanon. In many, in Yemen, of course. How can we stop? I don't know. Well, say how we can still, push. Do you, you watch what Egypt and Saudi Arabia are doing yeah, together? That's probably going to. That's probably going to be the gonna, only that's, option. That's going to be the option. That's probably. So gonna. before uh, we continue, you know, uh, you said that they're playing the game. Uh, they invented chess. You know? yeah. No, it was they're actually brilliant. the Indians. Thank is you very Indian? much. Thank you. I was the Indians. Really? Whole, I found so, the whole so this, Iranian, is, this is my mistake. I found the whole Iranian approach here brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Maybe Rehov Herzl, but the Iranian negotiation in Tel Aviv, the the. Persian traders, they're excellent, but uh, I'm too. not too impressed by Ayatollah Khamenei, with all due respect. Uh, no. <laughs> this approach is brilliant. You won't be able to get into <laughs> Iran, even if a, no. a, a many, deal will be signed with Iran. How many delays have there been in negotiation? How much has this been delayed? How much do they keep extending? It's I brilliant. think it's extremely unlikely. I, I, you have yeah. a very valid point there, Martin, but I think it's extremely unlikely that after eight sleepless nights in Lausanne, they just came out and said, well, you know, we read some, and this, this is what I was asking myself. Mm. What were they doing in Lausanne? I think the agreement was, and I'm making conspiracy theory alert, I think there was an agreement. Look, we reached this agreement, but you guys in Tehran, you made a lot of compromises. You said a lot of things that you would never do that you're going to do. So you want to go and lie to your own public? Okay. Go and pi lie to your own public. I mean, Ayatollah Khamenei said, I don't want to deal that's ambiguous that it's going to lead to different analysis. Guess what? This is exactly what we have. I told Khamenei, he said, I don't want to deal that they leave some of the sanctions in place. Guess what? Some of the sanctions will stay in place. There's, I mean, I could go on. There's, Iranians have made a lot of compromises here, and we can't expect them to all of a sudden to go and tell the public. If it's signed. It, I but think, no, no. It, <laughs> by the way, uh, I don't know if we have the time, but I would really love to hear from Mayor about the public opinion inside Iran, because he told me a couple of days ago that the, the people are just go, going people crazy are, uh, from Before that. you will say what the people in Iran think about that, let's uh, try to understand uh, what happened in the last few days. Uh, despite the great excitement, there are are still some misunderstandings or at least miscommunication between the parties. The news today's diplomatic correspondent Eli Ochenberg with those core gaps between world powers and Tehran.
there were many doubts regarding the actual chance of Western powers to reach any nuclear agreement with Iran, but last Thursday, history was made as the parties announced their success. This framework is the result of tough, principled diplomacy. It's a good deal, a deal that meets our core objectives, including strict limitations on Iran's program and cutting off every pathway that Iran could take to develop a nuclear weapon. But are the celebrations premature? Different versions of the interim agreement indicate there are gaps in the party's perceptions. Well, for the U.S., sanctions relief will be done gradually, lifted according to Tehran's compliance with the terms. For Iran, all sanctions will be lifted once a final agreement is sealed. The U.S. says Iran's uranium enrichment will be limited for 15 years. Tehran says it's 10 years. Iran does not mention inspections or access to facilities in its fact sheet, but says that for the sake of transparency and confidence building, it would implement an additional protocol on access to its nuclear facilities on a voluntary and temporary basis. While the U.S. insists Iran will use only older versions of the centrifuges, Iran's fact sheet describes an agreement to use the more advanced versions, as well as continue its research and development on advanced machines. If Iran on sheets, the world will know. If we see something suspicious, we will inspect it. So this deal is not based on trust. It is based on unprecedented verification. If for Obama, trust is not the issue, Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif seems to be using more blunt rhetoric. All United Nations Security Council resolutions related to Iran's nuclear program will be lifted immediately if a final deal is reached. The Americans put what they wanted in the fact sheet. I even protested this issue with Kerry himself. They realized they can't shut down Iran's nuclear program. Whether each side is now simply selling the framework agreement to its own people, trying to look like the winning side, or whether there are still crucial misunderstandings, there's a long way to go until a final historic deal. So are the celebrations, Mayor, premature that we're seeing on the streets of uh, Tehran? Look, you know, there's an old saying that uh, to the naked, a leaf is, 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 a, is, a, is a gown, and to the hungry, a breadcrumb is a feast. You know, it's been so depressing for the people of Iran, no good news. And all of a sudden, there's just some kind of hope, some kind of a light, and people are becoming very excited. And we Persians, we're pretty excitable people anyway. <laughs> we're very emotional. <laughs> And I'm not see seen, <laughs> I've not seen any joy like this since Iran beat America 2-1 in the 1998 World Cup. Uh, <laughs> it was just, just unbelievable. Um, people have a right to be happy. Look, no, look, I think, you know, people of Iran want to have a nuclear program, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but nobody asked them, do you think we should have 3,000 centrifuges, 6,000 centrifuges? Are you they don't really like care. that on the street? Uh, <laughs> I, well... Uh, you dance better. <laughs> when the Israeli embassy is open in Tehran, you can come and film me dance in front of it right there. <laughs> Um, it's really, you know, uh, I think people in general, they are very happy that they're going to have their life back, that there's going to be, uh, that they believe there's going to be normalization. What I think worries me, and I think it's now worrying the Rouhani government, and his, his economy minister said today, look, we got to relax the, the expectations, we got to lower our expectations because we're not going to see a sudden... Uh, a sudden boom in the economy. Mm -hmm. But that's not stopping the Tehran Stock Exchange today. It went up like a rocket. And not only that it went up, you know, sometimes I'm asking myself, maybe we're not giving, uh, and I'm saying we, maybe in Israel, uh, we're not giving uh, anyone the benefit of the doubt. We're not giving the benefit of the doubt for the United States. We're not giving the benefit of the doubt for Iran. And, you know, then Israel wonders why nobody gives it the benefit of the doubt. Just let us try to handle it. Let us try to handle what is happening with Hezbollah. Let us try to handle what is happening with Hamas, you know, when you don't trust anyone, don't expect anyone to trust you back. Yeah, but it's not just in Israel. You see, I think you got to take a wider look here. It's uh, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. It's Riyadh. It's Cairo. Uh, it's Amman. It's it's. If it was just Israel, I'd say you got a point there. But really, there's a huge, massive distrust of the United States here. Maybe there'll be a different feeling if 
you know, uh, Khamenei really signs it. But when, the, uh, when, when uh, Barack Obama is saying that there is still no trust between the U.S. and Iran, that uh, mm. the United States is not ignoring the involvement of Iran in terror, that the United States is not ignoring the involvement of Iran right now in the Middle East, it means that the United States is not ignoring what is happening. Well, I'm with sure Iran. he's not. It, 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 again, it all boils down to one thing. I can promise you millions of dollars. Lot, you know, it's like the story of uh, somebody trying to seduce somebody else, offering them a great life commitment, love, attention, everything, until it's signed and you break the glass or whatever you want to call it. Let's see what happens. No one has signed anything. You can promise yeah, everything. Yeah, but you know what is, is happening signed. right now in these days with the new age uh, married? Uh, it doesn't fact, uh, he's just work anymore. He's not happy with J-Date. He wants to go further in this <laughs> doesn't deal. Work yes. all, Let's see it all this then marriage that, concept is not working, you know, working I think it anymore. Will work, I think it would be a lot better and a lot, I think Obama have a much stronger position if something is signed. What about uh, Israel? Can Israel actually, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think in the last few days, um, that according to foreign reports, Israel also has some, like, a nuclear uh, program. Can it backfire at Israel that maybe somebody will come and say to Israel, you know what, you want to put some sanctions on other countries, you want other countries to be dismantled, maybe you should also be dismantled from nuclear programs. Look, I think that in the last couple of years, since we hear Israel criticizing Iran, criticizing even the U.S. for its policy and the uh, capability of negotiations, we had so many different chances that someone will go and criticize Israel and puts or try to put some sanctions on it because of the so-called uh, nuclear capabilities, according to the foreign press, of course, blah, blah, blah. Uh, till now, we hadn't seen anything like that. And, uh, and I don't think that we will see it coming now, especially after this agreement will be signed, if at some point So it I will, will take it to the bigger, bigger circle. You know, when the P5 plus 1 are signing or agreeing on such a deal, and the European and the West and the United States, what are the chances that uh, Israel won't be hit back in another issue like the Palestinian-Israeli yes. conflict. You are not solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We will put sanctions on you on this specific issue. Look, this might happen at some point, but I think it's still far. I think that we have different stage ahead of us before there will be sanctions in Israel about the Palestinian issue, about Because if you issues. don't trust us about Iran, we don't trust you concerning yeah, the Palestinians. Yeah, but then again, we have so many different problems right now that Israel, or not even Israel, but the U.S. and the world are dealing with, like Yemen. Like Syria, you know, the whole headlines in the last 48 hours in the Arab media, it's not about Iran at all. It's about Yemen. For them, this is the crucial war right now. So I don't think that we will see sanctions right now on Israel coming in a year or two. Well, it's a good uh, sure. These are good news. Finally, you're giving me some good <laughs> news in the beginning of the week. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very, very thank much you. for thank being you. with me in this part. We will see you on one-on-one -on, -one on a very new series of uh, yours uh, being broadcast right now in Israel and having great, great, great success. So we will see you just in a short while. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very thank you. much. I want to still want to see you dancing. Uh, we're going out for a small break. Two minutes and I'll be back. versions of the nuclear deal with Iran. The Iranian foreign minister says sanctions will be lifted immediately if a final deal is agreed upon, while the U.S. claims it will be gradual. Kenya begins three days of mourning for the 148 victims of the terror attack on students by militant group Al-Shabaab, while threats of additional attacks on the country circulate. Yemen's Houthi militiamen, supported by army units, gained ground in the southern city of Aden, pushing back loyalists of the Saudi-backed president. Welcome back. Kenya is mourning its dead three days after the terror attack in Gracia University left 148 people dead. Now, one of the gunmen has been identified as a promising law graduate. I-24 News reporter Uri Shapira has more. A tragic Easter in Kenya, three days after the horrific attack that left 148 people dead, and one where witnesses reported Christian being targeted 
separated from Muslims and sent to their death. In Gerisa, where the horrific attack occurred, residents attended the local church not just to mark the holiday, but to commemorate those who've been lost. A, a bit of worry and fear is almost every day because these attacks came as a, as a surprise, so you are not prepared for them. In the meantime, the investigation is underway. Authorities in Kenya have identified one of the four dead gunmen from the Al-Shabaab organization. The interior minister named him as Abdul Rahim Abdullahi, a son of Kenyan government official and a law graduate from the University of Nairobi. President Uhuru Kenyatta made a televised speech Saturday saying the full force of the law would be brought to bear on those who radicalize the country's youth. We tell those that believe a caliphate is possible in Kenya, that we are one indivisible, sovereign and democratic state. That fact will never change. Ever since Kenya became militarily involved in Somalia in 2011, it has become a clear target for the extremist jihadist group Al-Shabaab that has carried out series of deadly attacks in the country, including the one in Westgate Mall in 2013. Tuesday's attack was the deadliest in Kenya since the 1998 attack on the U.S. Embassy. Yes, and now uh, for something different, for a bit of perspective on how small we are and how big the universe is. At uh, Europe's Physics uh, Research Center, CERN, scientists today restarted the so-called Big Bang Large Hod, uh, Hadron Collider. It's an attempt to probe what's called the dark universe believed to exist beyond the visible one. And to understand a little bit more and to help put all this in plain English, with me is Professor, uh, Professor Eliam Grossa from the Physics Department at Israel's Weizmann Institute. Good evening. Thank you very much for Good coming. Good evening. You know, um, I'm trying to understand what is the dark universe. Sometimes I'm having some dark days but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know but there is a dark universe yeah, and explain know, to someone like yeah, me yeah. who failed in <laughs> physics what is the dark universe no, don't worry <laughs> it's okay the the universe that we know and we see and we actually experience is only five percent observed universe which interact with light and we can see is five percent five percent five percent so what i'm seeing is only five percent from what i'm not seeing about about 70% is dark energy and 25% is dark matter. So, okay. which, which means that actually we hardly know anything about uh, the universe. And you're right that we are so small and the universe is so big and we have no idea what's going on. Why Even though we made a huge progress in the last uh, You know, it's, years, it's you know. Uh, maybe something that we humans don't understand because, because we see, because we feel, because we smell. Um, we think that we know everything, but you're coming here and you're telling me no. that I don't see 95% of this world. It's like I'll tell you that uh, we don't even know what we don't know, okay? Most, most of the, the universe, I think we don't even know what we don't know. We have to be very modest because the universe is huge and we are that small and we know nothing. And actually... So, so, so that, why is this uh, research okay, because is so are, important? The research, because, because when you do... Because everything that happens is... Everything that happens around you, including this studio and the, all the cameras and the electronics, is thanks to the progress of science, of, of actually basic science. We do actually basic science. We try to actually improve the textbooks, okay? But then other people take it and make, make things out of it, make technology out of it. But we don't do the technology. We actually try to learn where we came from, what do we do here, why are we here, where do we go to. That's what we're trying to do in big science. So that's the purpose of man, and that's the difference of man from other species. Okay, man is trying, is driven by curiosity and trying to find out what's going on. And that's what they're doing. We are about 6,000 scientists there at the Central European Research Nuclear, 6,000 scientists driven by curiosity. And we're trying to understand. So two years ago, we discovered what is called the Higgs boson or the, the gold Higgs particle. Bond, yes. And now we're actually moving on. We discovered the Higgs boson. We want to understand even the, the Higgs itself, the gold particle, better. This gives mass to all known particles of nature and actually enables our life. We wouldn't be here without the Higgs boson, period. We wouldn't be here. And you wouldn't ask me a question because I wouldn't be here. 
But now we try to understand more, and we don't, we cannot, I cannot tell you what will come out of it. I have no idea what will come out of it, but we have to understand. We have to know what we are doing in, and what, where are the 95 percent that we don't what see. What is this uh, progress that you're talking about, um, uh, that we are watching right now in turn? Because Okay, I, let me correct you. What happened today, we just proved, it was a proof of principle. For the first time, after the upgrade of the Large Hadron Collider, the collider, to higher energy, we almost doubled the energy of the collision. When you double the energy of the collision, actually, you actually open a whole horizon for new physics that you haven't seen before. Because the bigger the energy, you are more sensitive to heavier particles that we don't see. Okay, so we doubled the energy, and for the first time after two years, we tried to circulate beams in both directions. It's a circular collider. Okay. We circulate beams in both directions, and we checked that it works that both beams actually go around the whole full circle. And now we are going to tune everything again, make ourselves ready. In June, we'll start the first physics. So you know, today was a proof of principle. But uh, based on what we already know, this is going to work. This yeah. is going to work, and we are going to be very excited. You know, it's, it's amazing, because uh, it brings me maybe and brings us uh, to uh, maybe the conception of uh, what you see, what what you don't see, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Right, that's correct. This is why science and religion that's are correct. so, uh, that, so, no, so but close. That's, that's dark, dark energy and dark matter we don't see, okay? Dark energy actually makes the universe expand, and dark matter is what keeps uh, all the stars rotate the <laughs> way they are, and we don't see it. We will bring you uh, for an interview one-on-one -on -one to understand a little bit more about the things that we be don't happy. see, because be the last sentence was just Japanese to me. <laughs> Thank you very, very Thank you. much, Thank you very uh, much. for this. Since Houthi fighters seized Yemen's capital, Sana'a, six months ago, the country has been uh, driven deep into conflict. What has become a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran in Yemen continues now with a rebel advance in the key city of Aden. I-24 News reporter Uri Shapiro has the latest. In the 11th day of the Saudi-led campaign against Houthi fighters in Yemen, rebel forces are gaining ground in the southern city of Aden. But just a day earlier, Saudi officials announced the city is mainly under the control of the pro-government fighters and airdropped weapons and ammunition to the pro-government fighters battling the Houthis. Aden as a city is under control of the committees. Uh, the militias and their uh, allied, they're still in some or part of the, uh, of the city. As fighting continues, Russia and the Red Cross appeal to the UN for a humanitarian pause in Yemen to allow aid in and the evacuation of civilians. The UN reports at least 500 people have died in Yemen over the last two weeks, while residents report parts of Aden have been left without electricity and running water. The Russian delegation circulated a draft resolution to the council members regarding humanitarian pauses in Yemen. The council members need time to reflect on the Russian proposal. Amid the deepening escalation, France evacuated 44 citizens from the country, along with hundreds of other foreigners who already fled Yemen last week. A senior member of the Houthi told Reuters that they are ready to sit down for peace talks as long as the Saudi-led campaign is halted and the negotiations are overseen by non-aggressive parties. That, however, may not be likely. And with me right now in the studio, Senior Middle East Analyst Ali Wakat. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. So uh, let's try to understand. Of course, we are seeing right now the proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Yemen. How much of effect there is on the so-called uh, deal or, let's say, uh, framework that was agreed upon in Lausanne on the fight in Yemen? Well, I'm, I'm identifying since the uh, uh, agreement or the framework agreement that the uh, Iranian, uh, through their medias, are more vocal vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, Yemeni uh, issue. Iran, who uh, made everything in order to guarantee the international community that is, it has nothing to do with the uh, Yemeni uh, crisis, allow itself uh, now to uh, uh, intervene at least uh, publicly and uh, through statements on what is happening uh, in Yemen. But if we are speaking about Iran, 
Iran. Uh, Lucy, in two days, Tuesday, there will be a, 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 a visit of the uh, Turkish uh, President Erdogan to uh, Tehran. Te Turkey is not participating in the Arab coalition, but it had put on the service, uh, in the service of the uh, coalition, its intelligence uh, regarding uh, uh, Yemen, and it's training some of the uh, forces participating, the Yemeni uh, uh, forces, and uh, um, Erdogan and uh, Tehran will try to reach some agreement that Erdogan can sell to the uh, Saudis and can sell uh, to the Arab uh, coalition in, in order to try to reach uh, some uh, uh, ceasefire. For the moment, we are seeing more signs that, uh, uh, that show that the situation is going to deteriorate. One, uh, Jordan, who is the president, the current president of the Security uh, Council, is refusing to bring to the table of the Security Council the Russian proposal for a ceasefire. Uh, Second, we are seeing humanitarian truce. By the way, uh, Saudi Arabia accepted in the last uh, minutes a humanitarian uh, truce, a humanitarian ceasefire that aims to allow states and countries to evacuate their, their citizens from Yemen, which is also a sign that situation is going more uh, towards a, a tougher confrontation. But if it remains Fight, uh, uh, strikes from the uh, from the air, from the air. without any uh, um, ground operation. I think we are going to see at the best a status quo that we are seeing uh, in the war and the fight against the Islamic State. You try to explain to me when the Houthis leader is trying to um, let's say provide a message of maybe he wants a ceasefire. Why is Iran still there when we are seeing that Saudi Arabia is against, when we are seeing that Turkey is against, when we are seeing that uh, Jordan is against, we are, when we are seeing that Iran is basically not really welcomed in Yemen? Why Iran continues to be involved there? Well, when you see that Iran is not welcome in Yemen, it depends who are you asking, because uh, the Houthis uh, have uh, gained uh, much more uh, ground and territory, not only because of Iran uh, support, but also because of the uh, uh, dissatisfaction of the Yemeni uh, population and some Yemeni tribes uh, from the uh, behavior and policies of the uh, of the uh, former uh, government, the, go the last government of uh, President uh, Hadi. What we are uh, seeing in general, not only in Yemen, it's a fight over territories, a fight over influences, be influence sorry, between uh, Saudi Arabia and between uh, 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 Iran. This is a cold war. This is the big cold war of the, of the region. Okay. It's a zero-sum yes. game for the moment, Lucy. Ali Wakad, uh, thank you very, very much for this. Lucy. In Libya's military-controlled city, Misrata, uh, a suicide bomber, blew up a vehicle at a checkpoint. Four people were killed and another 21 wounded. The Islamic State's group claimed responsibility supposedly on beheld of its uh, Tripolitania branch, like in Syria and Iraq, IS, has made its way well into Libya with branches in all three of the country's historic regions. An international outcry followed the new footage of Islamic State militants destroying historical artifacts from a region once considered the cradle of civilization. Shahal Pelad has more on the history being destroyed in present day. Islamic State jihadists have long proclaimed a war on culture. Alongside gruesome beheadings and torture in the name of religion, the radical Islamists have been systematically committing acts of vandalism on sites of vast cultural and historic significance. The Islamic State has sent us to these idols to destroy them. A new video from the production of IS has been released showing the destruction of statues and shrines of Hatra in Iraq, a city over 2,000 years old and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a desert site, stone built, pretty much one period only and it, and it wouldn't take much effort to destroy the whole lot. Indeed, the militants are seen seemingly effortlessly destroying the area, dismantling and literally shooting the artifacts that have survived two millennia. Hatra was an important religious and trading center and is believed to have been built in the 3rd or 2nd century BC. It was mainly ruled by the Parthian Empire and flourished as one of the cultural hearts of the Mesopotamia region. Despite the destruction and ongoing conflict in northern Iraq, Baghdad reopened the country's national museum for the first time in 12 years earlier last month. Where the ISIS has, uh, has destroyed or tried to destroy the heritage. That's uh, a counter narrative. We're saying we'll preserve that, we'll cherish it, and we'll certainly work with everybody uh, 
and will appreciate the support from everybody in this preservation. The city of Hatra is the latest in a long list of targeted ancient sites. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon had already branded the violent smashing of priceless artifacts as a war crime after the jihadists bulldozed the ancient Assyrian city of Nimrud and smashed artifacts in the Mosul Museum. The attacks on Iraq's archaeological heritage are taking place in IS-held areas in the northern province of Nineveh, where Iraq does not have security forces that are able to respond on the ground. Now that the cultural outrage around the world has grown, coalition forces carrying out airstrikes against the militants will have to focus, among other matters, on weakening the group's large-scale efforts to wipe out history as we know it. It will be unfair to animals to compare them to them. The German wing's plane crash in the Alps continues to have a ripple effect. Philippines have become the latest country to enact new aviation rules that require two airline crew to be in the cockpit at all times. Meanwhile, the investigation continues around co-pilot Andreas Lubitz, who had se severe uh, bouts of depression and intentionally crashed the Airbus with 148 other people on board. Yesterday, French investigators announced an end to the search for bodies while identification of victims based on DNA continues. And on a better note, the world's Christians are celebrating Easter on Sunday, which marks the day Jesus was uh, reserved uh, resurrected. Uh, the holiday uh, coincides with uh, the Jewish one as well, that uh, of Passover, the biblical exodus from Egypt. Here's more. Christians and Jews are observing two of the holiest festivals on their religious calendars. For Christians, it's the end of the Holy Week and the beginning of Easter Sunday. And festivities are coinciding with the Jewish holiday of Passover. The two intersect in Jerusalem, with Christians commemorating the resurrection of Jesus three days after his crucifixion, and Jews eating unleavened bread to remember the exodus from Egypt. Orthodox Christians are remembering Palm Sunday, the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And in Gaza, worshippers are praying for peace at one of only two churches in the territory. We all hope that this holiday will bring peace to humanity. We hope for people to live in peace without terrorism and without wars in the world. Meanwhile, Pope Francis is leading the world's 1.2 billion Roman Catholics into Easter his third since his election, and will speak from St. Peter's Square, delivering a message and a blessing from the Basilica's central balcony. For Kenyans, this Easter has been tainted by the militant attack on Garissa University, where nearly 150 people were killed in a shootout on Thursday. Nowhere is, uh, is, is safe, but in, here in charge you can come, you be with God, and then you just console yourself. Armed police are guarding Kenyan churches to protect their Easter Sunday congregations, a sign of the times for many minority populations around the world. Yes, and with me right now is correspondent and author Ayman Siksik. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. And you're talking about today a book that brings us, that brings um, culture back yes. to our lives. The joy of the liberal arts. You know, and I want to start with a little bit of a grim note. We just saw the story about the IS destroying a cultural, yes. priceless cultural heritage site in Iraq. And, you know, it brings up the question, what would happen if these people had a deep-rooted, cultural liberal education where you would appreciate the arts and you would appreciate history instead of just Islamist institutionalized education. Yeah, we talked about it just before we came into broadcast and we said that maybe this should be the new education in the Muslim world. Exactly, and this yes. exactly is uh, Fareed Zakaria's point. He's of course the CNN host of the show titled after his own name, a famous columnist for the Washington Post. And here he claims specifically for the U.S. this is really a very, very press pressing issue. In uh, both North Carolina, Texas, and uh, in Florida, the governors are now cutting back on uh, programs that finance the liberal arts, that is music and art history, and uh, even sports uh, in some respects, and of course, literature. So when, there's, when money's tight, these are the first things to be hurt. And of course, one of the main uh, arguments against this kind of education is 
it doesn't make money. You know, it's an, and it's always uh, it's like exactly what we're seeing here in Israel because uh, the education system is not getting enough like other systems in Israel, and we are seeing it and we're feeling it each and every day by seeing some of the deterioration in the education system in Israel. Precisely, and even a deterioration in society. As m the more society gets militarized, and the more we're focused on um, military and security and things less like that, less tolerant, less. Precisely, and this is exactly what a liberal education can afford us with. And in the U.S. specifically, he's saying that hurting these programs is really changing the nature of uh, American society. There's focus on engineering, there's focus on computer sciences, because the main argument is this is how you make money. But he's saying uh, education like this is often uh, outdated very fast. These um, um, you know, subjects get automated, they get outsourced, they change often. But a liberal education that makes you appreciate the world around you and society around yeah, you. Yeah, it's exactly what you uh, brought there with uh, ISIS destroying uh, the, this archaeological history, and and when you don't when you don't study history, when you don't study literature, when you don't study culture, you don't appreciate it. Exactly, and these are virtues that remain with you throughout your life. You continue to learn through learning these, and even if you want to study engineering, learning theater and literature and music can help you, and this is scientifically proven. Yeah, this is the time that the Muslim world will start re-educating and rethinking about the whole way that it was educating their children in Inshallah, the last Inshallah, as we say. Inshallah, Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. The Palestinian village of Ikrit was uh, deserted in 1948 and later became part of the state of Israel. But the grandchildren of those who live there have been fighting to keep the Christian his history of Ikrit alive. Last week, a decision by the Israeli High Court inspired hope in their 67-year battle. So, Shizli and Ayman Siksik have more. In the scenery of the many churches in the Galilee, this one is unique. This church is all that remains from a village deserted in 1951, Ikrit. The church remained unattended until the descendants of those who used to live here decided to bring life and light back to the building. Last week, the State of Israel agreed to connect the church to electricity after 67 years of darkness. Since 1948, we've been managing electricity ourselves, using either solar panels or a generator. This is the first time Israel has recognized us and decided to provide electricity to the church. We consider this a formal recognition of our village and its people and of our battle. The decision by the Israeli Supreme Court followed a long battle by the people of Ikrit, but has not yet been implemented, highlighting the tension between the decisions by the Israeli court and reality on the ground. The cemetery still stands, but up until the 70s, we were unable to perform any burials there. In the 70s, the military rule ended. My grandparents are buried here, and I will be buried here too someday. In a way, our only possibility of returning to our village is as dead bodies. Today, in 2015, a new generation of Vikrit families are planting new seeds in the once deserted village in the hopes of creating a new history where the previous one has been erased. And as they wait, the grandchildren of Ikrit residents have the motto of their ancestors in mind. We are no longer refugees, we have returned. Yeah, when you fight about your history, on a different note, and out of sports. And with me right now is the host of I-24 News yes, Sports yes. Magazine, Jono. Jono, the man Jono. causing smiles. I'm so happy. You're always making me smile. Yes, yes. Even I'm very happy when to do this. the dark universe, <laughs> like we just spoke before, is really bad. I am the universe of light. Uh, let's talk about uh, happy things. Yeah, I wasn't meaning to speak about Spanish football, but hey, how many times does a team win 9-1? Uh, win how many times Ronaldo scores? Five goals, five goals per match. So we'll just say... Uh, we'll Madrid. have tomorrow the pictures. Yes, tomorrow we'll yes, have the images. Yes. They will be here. Five, five goals for Ronaldo. Five goals. I'm just nine happy. One. I'm just happy we played against Portugal uh, and uh, against Wales and not against Portugal. Gareth Bale scored one today. Just one. One. <laughs> one. He scored two against one is, is a basketball game. Yes, it's yeah. a basketball. It's result. a basketball game. That was the result today between <laughs> Real Madrid 
and Granada. Let's talk about Bayern Munich. Yeah, Germany, the game between Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund is always big. 30 points separate uh, now between the two teams, but every time Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund meet, it's, it's a great thing. We see the great managers, Pep Guardiola on one side, Jurgen Klopp on the other side, and there we see Bayern Munich. They didn't score here, they did score on their next possession, and maybe the mo it's the most symbolic thing of all, who's the man that scored? Robert Lewandowski, the man that moved in the summer from Borussia Dortmund to Bayern Munich. No one in Germany can compete with the big money in Bavaria, and that's that's how they do it. He had the he had the dignity not to not to celebrate in front of his former home fans. Well, it, it's nice. It is. It is nice. A lot it's, of players nice. in Israel and abroad should It's nice learn. and it's full of respect. Yes, uh, I, I agree. Paris Saint-Germain. I heard a lot of yells today here. Fans like videos all over. Were there fights? Uh, Did they fight? <laughs> I was no, hoping. not yet. <laughs> yeah, the game hasn't started yet. Yeah, Wait yeah, for the game to not start. Not yet. The Le Classique, they call it the biggest match in France, Marseille against Paris Saint-Germain. Always big, just like we said in Germany. But this time, it's especially big since these two teams are two of the three competing for the in a very, very close title race in France. So uh, this match today is in the Stade Velodrome in Marseille. Surely one to watch in just over, over an hour. Any result here could seriously affect the championship race in France. Interesting to see. So the yells came, uh, just, uh, we'll say, from uh, Jean-Charles' computer, uh, our, uh, just um, yeah. the host of uh, Le, uh, the anticipation. Le Grand Direct in, uh, yes, yeah. the uh, anticipation in France. The anticipation causes that. Um, but world Championship. Yes, in marbles. In marble? Yes, there is such a thing. And believe it or not, it dates back to the 16th century. See how many emotions it brings out. And the Germans, the German team, they they won the World Cup again because I know I didn't play this since I was 3 years old. So some Germans, Five. some Germans Stops. played now and they are world champions for the second time in a row. It dates back to the 16th century, believe it or not. <laughs> there, there's a German team, an American team. We need team. to do a match outside. Yeah, like yeah. marbles and Le Classique. Let's and the, the, fix the something. Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, it's the, gonna be lovely. Le Classique. <laughs> Jonathan Reagan, thank you very much. Thank okay, you, we're going out for a break. Two minutes, five, three, two, one, out.